Donald Trump went to an unlikely venue to hold a town hall meeting Wednesday night U.S. time. It's the belly of the beast, CNN. It was quite a performance with as much for the Trump fans as for the haters. Here's a little taste. Can you say if you want Ukraine or Russia to win this war? I want everybody to stop dying. They're dying, Russians and Ukrainians. I want them to stop dying. But you said you weren't very involved that day. You did tell your supporters to come to Washington. You tweeted about it, about sure, that speech that happened on the rally. Am I allowed so when to they, say that? When they went to the Capitol and they were breaking into the Capitol, smashing windows, injuring police officers, why did, you, why did it take you three hours to tell them to go home? I don't believe it did. Oh, let me pull it out. I have to pull it out. <laughs> on January 5th, the day before, I said, please support our Capitol Police and law enforcement. They are truly on the side of our country. Stay peaceful. Stay peaceful. This was the day before, and this was in the form of Twitter. Now use truth, truth social. I think it's far superior, okay? I hope everybody's on truth. I hope everybody's on truth. Uh, if you look, January 6th, this is at 2, before 2.30. I am asking for everyone at the U.S. Capitol to remain peaceful. This is right after, as it was happening. But what happened is they took it down. I don't know why. I think they took it down because it was so good. They didn't like it being up there. And like the bourbon kings of old, the usual suspects on the left have forgotten nothing and learned nothing. You know, I, I know you said earlier that you will not comment on the platforming of um, such atrocious disinformation, but I, I would. I think it was a profoundly irresponsible decision. It was just, it was disgraceful on every level. It showed, uh, I, won't, I wouldn't say it's dangerous for democracy because we passed that a long time ago, but it showed the corrosive effects of Trumpism over eight years. Now from the presidential uh, town hall for, with CNN, Caitlin Collins, and whatever the f they thought they were going to get out of this, they instead have set a match to democracy once again. Taking it well then, are we? Look, this gets back to what I've been saying all along. This ranting Democrat insanity only plays into Trump's hands. Everyone on the left who is losing their mind at the prospect of Donald Trump being given a national platform again are only offering a negative. It reminds me a lot of when Bill Clinton was president and Republicans said, where's the outrage about this horrible, uncouth, philandering man in the Oval Office? And at the same time, Democrats rode a wave of prosperity kicked off, lest we forget, by Ronald Reagan to eight years in office. But in politics, people need more than the negative. So sorry to all the Biden supporters out there, but you'll need more than high inflation, open borders and bizarre political agendas in the schools to get it over the line in November. Joining me now is our U.S. Report regular, former White House Chief of Staff and Senior Advisor at Bondi Partners, Mick Mulvaney. Mick, so glad to have you back here uh, after a couple of weeks. And I want to get your thoughts, first of all, on Trump's big CNN town hall. What did you make of it? Yeah, James, it's great to see. It's been too long. Uh, a lot of things happening here, obviously. Um, I, I, I thought he did great if the goal was to win the Republican primary. I thought he did very poorly if the goal was to be president again. He satisfied his crowd. He, he was a, it was a crowd of Trump faithful. He gave them all the greatest hits. It's sort of like going to watch the Rolling Stones in concert. You know exactly what you're going to get, and they're pretty darn good at it. Well, there's not a lot of new people listening to the Rolling Stones that haven't been listening to them for the last 60 years. And that's sort of the impression I got was that he did not do a single thing last night, James, I don't think, to add to this voting base that he needs in 2024 to win the election. So if the goal was to win the Republican primary, good for him. If the goal is to be president, I don't think it was a very good night. Yeah, I, look, and I think I, I take your point very much. But I want to ask you this question, though. If you're a voter out there and you watch that performance, do you think Joe, they're going to be thinking in their minds, well, Donald Trump was able to do this performance, but could Joe Biden do a similar thing? Could Joe Biden, you know, get up, get in front of a crowd, 
take spontaneous questions to the extent they were spontaneous. And do you think that's going to start to play on people's minds? Uh, it absolutely is. You're already seeing in the polling data, a majority of people, there's a big national poll out last week, a majority of people question Biden's mental and physical ability to do the job. So they're already asking that question. In fact, I think Joe Biden, I don't know if it's made its, the news has made its way down to Australia yet tonight or not, but had a major gaffe today uh, on Irish, American and British relations when he actually went off script in a private conversation. And it's going to take six months to probably undo the damage that Biden did there. No, Biden is much, much worse than Trump when it comes to being able to debate and campaign. The question is, if Trump is the nominee, will the American people face a choice between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, or will they look at this as a referendum on Donald Trump? Donald Trump mm. did that to himself in 2020. He made the election about him. People did not vote for Joe Biden. They either voted for Donald Trump or against Donald Trump. So, yeah, can, 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 can Trump beat Biden? Absolutely. Can Trump beat himself? A hundred percent. And do you think that um, it's just interesting, obviously, that the left is now furious that CNN has given Trump a platform on this for fairly obvious reasons. But I also saw in all of this, the, the moderator of this, she seemed to make it kind of a debate between her and Trump. Do you think that was a wise strategy? No, face it. She's a, any. I know Caitlin um, Collins. She's a she's a, she's a good reporter, but I mean, she's a left leaning personality, and she has a lot of friends who are left leaning. And she had to go home that night and face all of her friends on social media. She's going to have to go to her cocktail parties in Washington D.C. this weekend and defend herself to her liberal friends. So, yeah, did she make herself part of the story? She absolutely did. Did Trump invite it and and sort of encourage it? Yes, he absolutely did. There's no question about that. It is a secondary story. I think to the larger the larger mm. issue of whether or not Trump did a good job and was successful, but certainly Caitlin Collins struggled under very very difficult circumstances. And I want to switch uh, gears now, Mick, to this whole story around this investigation of the president, the family's finances, the Biden family, these essentially Chinese government front groups that may have been funneling money into the family, and now news that the FBI has refused to give Congress an informant file alleging that the president took bribes while he was vice president. Do you think something smells here, or is this standard business between the Congress and the FBI, or is this a potential constitutional crisis in the making? Uh, yeah, I think it's probably the latter. Keep in mind, by denying Congress the document, what the FBI essentially did today was admit that it exists. And they said, you know, I think they, they claimed that it was a confidential document and that therefore it's, it's not able to be given to the Congress. I can assure you, having been in Congress, they are going to disagree with that. They don't believe that any confidentiality requirements internal to the FBI would prevent Congress from doing its constitutional duty. Um, so no, there is going to be a constitutional challenge. I think that's correct. But the whole thing does smell. Um, it, it's a lot of money to a family that doesn't have any experience in the things they apparently got paid for. There's a lot of smoke. Now, that being said, there's no fire yet. There's no hard evidence. There's just a bunch of questions that are going to go unanswered right now. Uh, but there's no evidence that Biden actually did anything illegal. There's no evidence that this was at all illegal. But it really, really looks bad for the president and his family. And it certainly bears further investigation. And that's exactly what the Republicans in the House are going to do. Well, Mick, you know, you and I are both students of modern American presidential history, and I was saying to my panel earlier tonight that this feels a lot like when they used to ask about Richard Nixon, what did the president know and when did he know it? But it seems like there's a real lack of curiosity among many members of the media about whether or not there is a direct link to the president. Right now, they seem to be taking the White House's word for it that, oh, well, no, there's not a direct link, so it doesn't affect the president. And that's one of the real sad parts about the status of our republic right now is that the media, which is supposed to hold both parties, all parties accountable, they're supposed to be the sort of that, that public light that shines upon the government. They're not doing that. I mean, if this had been Donald Trump, they'd be all over it, as we say in, my, in the southern part of the states, like a hobo on a ham sandwich. They, they, they couldn't let it go. Okay, but since it's since it's their guy, since it's the person from their party, since it's their chosen candidate, they choose to look the other way and instead attack, you know, Congressman Comer, the head of the of the of the investigation committee, for personal attacks on the president and so forth. So no, it's it really is sad. By the way, the other thing we learned from um, from Watergate was also to follow the money. 
Mm. Um, and that I think is exactly what they're going to be doing. They're going to follow this money, find out where it came from and where it goes. Uh, and again, I have full confidence that the Republicans in the House are going to maintain this investigation, despite the pushback they get from the FBI and the lack of cooperation from the mainstream press. Finally, Mick, before I let you go, I want to ask you about California Senator uh, Dianne Feinstein. Uh, we saw her this week arriving at the Capitol in a wheelchair uh, in photos following her nearly three months absence, they said, because of shingles, which is, of course, a terrible thing to suffer. There are calls for her to retire. Um, why are the Democrats continuing to let her stay in this seat? Well, it's really hard to, to sort of push out one of the, the grand dames of the Senate. I mean, Dianne Feinstein is, is an institution, not only in the Senate, but especially in the Democrat Party, and most especially in the Democrat Party in California. No Democrat in that state wants to be perceived as, as pushing this, this groundbreaking, this iconic woman out of office. Um, but I've dealt with dementia in my family. I don't know if you have or not. Um, mm. The things I'm hearing about Diane's condition are not particularly good. It, it, it's quickly going to come to a time where they're going to have to decide, um, do they want two senators in California? Or are they just going to rely on one? Because I'm not sure right now um, that she's up to the job based upon what I'm hearing here in Washington, D.C. It's sad to say, and again, I, I, I take no joy from that having been through dementia myself mm. and my family. Um, but this is a serious job. California's an important state. Every state's important. They need two senators, and I'm not sure she's up to the job right now. Indeed, Mick, it's, uh, it is indeed very sad. But thank you so much for your time and look forward to speaking again soon. Now, before we go to the break, you ever heard the phrase, too much information? Well, have a look at this and enjoy the uncomfortable pause before everyone gets the joke Joe Biden is making here about thin walls. In a three-bedroom split-level home and a housing development that got, it was a nice area. That was when they were developing suburbia with four kids and a grandpa living with us. I, I look back on and wonder how thin those walls were for my mom and dad, but at any rate. Amazingly, this isn't the first time he has made this cringeworthy gag, and I thought it sounded familiar, and I was right. Turns out he did the same routine while running from the basement in 2020. Sometimes look back and wonder how my parents did it with those very thin walls. <laughs> but my point is this, we, we, we did fine. Too much information, Mr. President. <laughs>